and that can make that noise. Okay. Um, Welcome, everybody, to uh, the Quattron Center for the Fair Administration of Justice here at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. My name is John Hallway. I'm the executive director of the center. And on behalf of uh, my colleagues, uh, Ted Ruger, who's the dean of the law school, um, uh, I'd like to welcome all of you here to our annual uh, Exoneree Fellow Talk. Um, it is an absolute honor. I noticed that the Innocence Project has stolen our branding for the event uh, by getting their slides up early. That's very canny marketing by the Innocence Project. Um, but it is, our, it is our great pleasure and honor to have uh, Keith Harward here this year as our annual Exoneree Fellow. Um, and we're going to uh, talk about uh, Keith's case. We're going to talk about um, the, the many areas in which uh, mistakes were made. And to support us in that conversation, we really could not have a more uh, experienced, thoughtful, and knowledgeable panel um, uh, and we will hear, uh, as, the, as the evening goes on, uh, from Mary Bush, an associate professor of restorative dentistry uh, at the uh, University of Buffalo School of Dental Medicine, uh, Peter Bush, director of the South Campus Instrument Center, and uh, Chris Fabricant, uh, who is the head of special litigation and is the Joseph Flom special counsel for the Innocence Project. Um, the, format of what we'll do is I'll make a couple of introductory remarks. Um, you know, we know that, that you guys are here to hear from the experts and in particular to hear from, from Keith. Um, at Keith's request, he actually prefers fielding your questions to holding forth. And so the order that we'll go in is Chris and Keith will kind of tag team on the facts of Keith's case. Uh, we'll turn it over to Mary and Peter who authored uh, really the, the, the very rigorous peer-reviewed uh, scientific research that um, debunks bite mark comparison as a scientific field of inquiry. And we'll do that in kind of two stages. Um, because of course, when we talk about forensic errors, we really talk about errors at a couple of different places. Um, first, there are um, uh, errors in the gathering of data sometimes happen, contamination errors. Then there are um, evaluation errors, errors that happen when we are looking at that evidence. But then the legal system has a role to play in errors in forensics as well in terms of uh, how we admit those errors and whether we actually admit that those things are errors and when errors happen. And so uh, Peter will talk about some of the backlash that their science and they have received from the uh, forensics community. Uh, and at that point then we'll open it up for your questions uh, as we go. When we do get to the questions, one administrative item, we are recording this and do plan to keep it uh, as a webcast. So um, if you do have a question, we will bring a microphone to you. And if you could, uh, even if you think you project, and I'm sure you do, uh, we need to get you on the mic so that we can have that for the, for the video. So if you could just keep that in mind. Um, forensic errors are kind of a big deal. So there's a lot more of them than people might think. The CSI effect makes us think that we can discover anything and immediately prove uh, one in you know, an, an absolute identical match to the exclusion of everybody else in the known universe. Uh, and the reality is actually very different. So um, of the 2,177 uh, known exonerations to date in the National Registry of Exonerations, um, 522 of them are forensic errors, so that's about a quarter of those errors are due to some sort of forensic problem. Um, and that actually doesn't count the 30,000 cases that were dismissed in Massachusetts alone due to uh, two analysts, one of whom was simply creating uh, false uh, tests, and the other one was a cocaine addict who had sort of a sampling the merchandise problem. Um, <laughs> And so we have, you know, not, this is not just the deliberate errors where if you have one or two analysts, they can have a huge negative impact on the system. These are our ostensibly conscientious, good faith, hardworking analysts nonetheless getting it wrong in our system of forensic justice. Um, we know that our forensic disciplines need improvement. The National Academy of Science issued a report on the state of the industry in 2009, so almost a decade ago, in which they pointed out that the vast majority of our forensic comparative disciplines originated not in a scientific setting, but in a police investigative setting. And as a result, while people in good faith believe that they're comparing X to Y and they're finding matches, the fact of the matter is, is that foundational scientific studies and rigorous peer-reviewed clinical trials have never been done to actually validate these disciplines as legitimate fields of scientific inquiry. Despite that, 
we have numerous people who have styled themselves as experts in a scientific field who get certified as experts within our courts and who testify to a quote unquote reasonable degree of scientific certainty that a particular match has been made uh, at, at a level of statistical significance that simply can't be supported by the, avari by the available science. And while we're going to talk about bite marks today, and I think bite marks are probably the most extreme case of science that, that has gone off the rails and isn't really science, the fact of the matter is that the potential ramifications of this, if we don't start getting it right, are much broader because it applies to any comparative discipline. The President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology in 2016, so just a year and a half ago, looked at seven disciplines uh, or eight disciplines, and the only one that they found had a really strong scientific underpinning was DNA evidence. So single source DNA has been scientifically proved and rigorous clinical studies have been done such that we know what the error rate is of those calculations and therefore, because we have an error rate that is replicable and validated, we can then extrapolate from that what the likelihood is that we are getting it wrong when we make a comparison that says this DNA matches this person. But even multiple source DNA does not yet reach that level of scientific scrutiny. And in multiple source DNA, you have a, mix, a mixture of DNA from more than one source. And an analyst actually has to compare a picture of alleles and makes a subjective human decision, not uh, something that, that comes from a chemical basis or, a, or an instrumentation, but a human subjective decision about which of those alleles belong in which genetic profile. And so even there, we have a subjectivity problem, but we're talking about hair follicle comparison, we're talking about ballistics, we're talking about shoe prints and tire tracks, we're talking about handwriting analysis, and we're even talking about fingerprints and ballistics. So these are the areas that are real uh, staples and real foundations of our investigational methods. It's not that we're wrong in any particular case, it's that from a scientific perspective, we don't know how often we get it wrong, and therefore we can't make statements that are certain that we've gotten it right, and yet we do that all the time in the criminal justice system. Now, bite marks actually are a step beyond that, because as you'll hear from the Bushes, um, bite marks have no scientific foundation whatsoever, and in fact, the groundbreaking research that the Bushes did, which uh, I'm going to say 25 peer-reviewed publications. Is that accurate? Well, 15. 15 peer-reviewed publications uh, dating back to 2010. The Bushes have systematically shown that the uniqueness of one person's bite print has not been scientifically established, that the ability of teeth to transfer a unique pattern to human skin cannot be shown, and that the ability of skin to be a substrate that maintains that imprint in a reliable fashion cannot be shown. And so when you put all these things together, it becomes pretty hard to take the position that a bite mark on somebody's body can be compared to and connected to another human being. Furthermore, a standard for the type, quality, and number of characteristics that's required to indicate that a bite mark has reached a threshold of evidentiary value has never been established. So at least with fingerprints, we say, look, you've got to have 11 points of comparison. Now that number varies jurisdiction to jurisdiction, but at least we have agreement on what that number is. In bite marks, we don't even have that. As a result of this, when the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology, which brings together a cross-section of the brightest scientists in the nation across a variety of disciplines, looked at these comparative disciplines, they came to the conclusion that, and I'm quoting now, all of the available scientific evidence strongly suggests that examiners not only cannot identify the source of bite marks with reasonable accuracy, they can't even agree consistently on whether an injury is a human bite mark. So our bite mark experts can't actually differentiate on a reliable and agreed upon basis between a human bite and a dog bite. For these reasons, PPS found that bite mark analysis is far from meeting the scientific standards for foundational validity and they actually recommended that no further research be donated, be, be uh, attempted uh, in this field because of the research to the contrary. In addition, we have a high possibility for cognitive bias and prejudice in the field because the agencies bring a comparison and a limited number of possible molds 
and because bite marks are often associated with highly sensationalized cases where the pressure to find a conviction and the knowledge of the fact that you're trying to compare this with a potential suspect is, is uh, pronounced. Um, blind comparisons and the use of a second expert, which are things that are commonly used in other fields, are not routinely used in the bite mark field. And here's really the kicker, is that jurors don't understand these facts. So the Bushes are going to give us some data on how often examiners get it wrong amongst themselves. But in a survey of potential of mock jurors looking at the frequency of error from qualified expert forensic scientists, what jurors said was that they think that the odds of somebody getting it wrong in bite mark comparison is one in a million. Now I think what you're going to hear from the Bushes is that that rate is smaller. <laughs> but I'll, I'll let them give you the punchline. Now, in theory, we're supposed to have legal protections that deal with this. We've got Federal Rule of Evidence 702 that talks about having uh, admitting science that is the product of reliable principles and methods that is reliably applied by an expert. And we have both the Fry and Daubert decisions from the Supreme Court that state that you have to, that they'll only admit things that are generally accepted in a scientific field or, in the more recent Daubert decision, methodology that must be scientifically valid is the framework used by the court which means that the theory has been tested, that it's been peer-reviewed, and importantly, requires a known or potential rate of error in addition to being generally accepted by the relevant scientific community. Now, by the Daubert standard, bite mark evidence should not be admissible in court because it has not been validated, because we do not have an error rate, which is prong three of the Daubert test. The problem is that with science and expert testimony, we have what I think of as a shoots and ladders problem. The Bushes are doing peer-reviewed, randomized clinical trials. They are advancing science, and science advances, think of that as the ladders in our shoots and ladder game, one step at a time, moving things forward. Now, the courts have a reasonable want, a reasonable desire to make sure that this, as science progresses, that science has a chance to go through a validation process, to be out there in the marketplace of ideas and to be tested before it gets admitted in court. And so under the auspices of being responsible and not moving into our science too quickly, courts like to rely on precedent. We like to see that another court has done it, that it's been accepted, and that somebody else has already taken that plunge. The problem that can happen is this. The very first bite mark case to be admitted in court was admitted in California in a decision uh, called the Marks case in 1975. It was a bench trial, a trial without a jury. And in that decision, the court acknowledged that there was no scientific basis for the bite mark testimony and no evidence of a systemic or orderly experimentation in this area. Notwithstanding that, the court declined to have a fry hearing and simply admitted it, believing that one could compare a bite mark to a, a human mold. The judge thought, there's enough to it, and so I'll admit it. And that was upheld on appeal. Well, now we have a precedential decision that one court can look at and say, well, another court has admitted this in evidence, so it must be OK for me. Over the course of the next 13 years, there were 16 opinions in 12 states that specifically cited the Marx case or relied on Marx's judicial eyeballing test to admit other bite marks. And in 1988, the West Virginia Supreme Court said that bite marks were so universally accepted, because 21 appellate courts had agreed, that there was no need for a fry hearing. And what this means is that that's in 19, 1988. So by 1993, <coughs> when we create the Daubert standard, bite marks have effectively been grandfathered in. And notwithstanding the fact that bite marks don't meet the Daubert standard, we have a whole bunch of courts that have established precedential rulings. So in effect, what these courts have done is they've used precedent as the slide, as the shoot in our shoots and ladders game to return us back to a period before the science that of, of the ladder of our science was constructed. And as a result, we have the perfect storm for error. So we have police investigators who are gathering the information, analysts who are using techniques without foundations to make subjective decisions that lack standards, prosecutors who promote these experts and accept their conclusions without questioning them, judges who don't understand the science and admit the information based on established precedent, defense attorneys who either don't know or can't fight this precedent, and a jury that thinks that it's really CSI when actually it's BS. <laughs> that brings us to the story of Keith Harward. And to tell the story, I'm going to turn it over to Chris and Keith. 
Um, but I will just say this. Um, I heard Keith speak at the National Commission on Forensic Science where he made an impassioned appeal to a multidisciplinary group of uh, legal practitioners and, sci and scientists uh, about the dangers of, of bite marks. And he was immediately followed by a representative from the National District Attorneys Association who took the other side. And I think after you've heard uh, from these four speakers, um, I, I'll, be, uh, I'll be stunned if you don't feel the way I did, which was, we got to get this guy more coverage. Chris? Thanks, John. I, uh, it's kind of appropriate that I'm sitting in between these two is that my job is really to put the science of Peter and Mary and scientists like them to work to free people like Keith Harward. It's a real honor to be sitting up here with uh, all of them. I, um, I wanted to basically, this is really Keith's story. And sometimes it's easier to tell these stories from the lawyers that were involved in it because Keith lived it day in, day out for 34 years. And then I'm going to say a little bit about how we got involved. And, and really, and, and I think that John made a really good point in that the problems that are associated with bite marks are not exclusive to bite marks. They're certainly the redheaded stepchild of forensic disciplines. And I was talking with David from the Prosecuting Attorneys Association, not the same people, but the, who had kind of agreed with me a little bit on that, so I don't want to put words in your mouth, but the, um, and we're going to talk about how we identified this case and everything that happened all the way up until the point where we finally walked um, Keith out of prison. It begins with this man who's uh, actually going to be clerking in the Southern District pretty soon, but at the time of this picture was taken, he was my paralegal. And strategic litigation at the Innocence Project um, works uh, around litigating all of the leading contributing factors to wrongful conviction. And my role, apart from running the department, is litigation around forensic sciences. And no more uh, discreet discipline has contributed to more wrongful convictions, apart from hair microspecy, than bite mark analysis. And I had been doing criminal law for 20 years before I got to the Innocence Project, and I had never even heard of bite mark evidence. I had never had a case involving bite mark evidence at all. It's a very, very obscure discipline. And the fact that there have been so many wrongful convictions ought to tell you quite a bit. And so what our paralegals do is that they comb all of Westlaw, all of LexisNexis, all of Google every day. And they're looking for case law. And they're looking for new cases. And they're looking for emerging issues in forensics. And Eric came across Mr. Harward's case um, in August of 2014. And he wrote me an email. And he said, you know, hey, Chris. I just came across this appellate decision, and it's really crazy. You got to take a look at it. And so he sent me an email, and this is a summary from the facts in that um, court decision. So I was looking at it, and it was like saying, this is the way that the appellate court characterized the night that began both the victim's nightmare and Keith Harward's nightmare in September 14th, 1982. And saying that on the night, on September 14th, 1982, Jerry Crotty. You know, see, this is the, the red in brackets there for those of you lawyers, is that that's not the word that was in the actual opinion. In the opinion, it says Keith Harward. Today, we know that it's Jerry Crotty. Broke into the home of Jesse and Teresa Perone while the Perones were, and their three children were asleep. Teresa, Teresa was woken by a loud noise and discovered Crotty hitting her husband with a crowbar. She was laying in bed. Somebody broke into her house and started beating her husband in, in the head with a crowbar. He pulled her out of bed. She fell on the floor. He pinned her to the floor. He put his legs over her and continued to hit her husband in the head with a crowbar. He told her that he didn't want to kill her husband, only to knock him out. And that he also wanted, <clears throat> he also warned her that if she didn't do what he said, he would kill her children. He spent the evening raping her. He forced her to commit oral sodomy and submit to anal sodomy. And during the course of the sexual assaults, and this is important uh, for obvious reasons. Mr. Crotty bit Miss Perone on the thighs and the calves of her legs, leaving multiple visible bite marks. What's interesting about that is that a lot of bite mark cases, you only get one, and it's often may or may not be a bite mark. This one, we knew it was a bite mark. The victim said it was a bite mark. The victim saw the perpetrator biting her on the legs, and we saw multiple images of the same teeth that created the same bite mark. So really, in the annals of bite mark cases, this is about as good as you get. The, um, he finally left. She called the police. She was taken. This is all in, straight from the appellate decision. So I'm reading this, and it says that they, they took a perk kit. They photographed her legs. 
And then it says here at the bottom that, you know, she was never able to make an identification. I was like, Jesus, this is the appellate opinion affirming this conviction. And I'm reading it, and he's like, he sounds innocent in the appeal. And so we take a look at this, and I said to him, um, to my uh, paralegal, I was like, well, let's take a look and see whether or not he's ever written to us. And of course he had. So I'm going to go back to where we started the investigate, or where they started the investigation on that night. And what happened was is that the investigation, the, the woman said, and, and I went back there, um, the, the victim, is that there was a white sailor's uniform. This happened in, outside of Newport News, Virginia, where there was a USS Carl Vinson, um, which is actually still in service. It was attacked, I think, a couple of summers ago. But the, um, and she said that the sailor had three nested Vs on um, his uniform, indicating a, well, I don't know, what, what rank is that? Seaman. Seamen, right? So, so they weren't going to look at anybody above a seaman. So the investigation focused on the sailors below a certain rank. And you were on the USS Carl Vinson at one point, right? Yes. And so at this time, uh, Mr. Harwar is an active uh, member of the Navy and happened to be on the same ship. And they focused on this because there was a, a gatekeeper who had seen somebody with um, uh, in a uniform with blood on the uniform, apparently of the same rank, come in very late at night um, on the night of the murder. They, uh, they indicated as an E3 or below and that the intruder left bite marks on the legs of his rape victim and that this request from the Commonwealth's attorney is that you examine the dental records of everybody essentially on this boat that could have left these bite marks on the victim's legs. And so between September 1982 and February 1983, a Navy dentist, Dr. Lutkus, and a local dentist, Dr. Bain, screened 1,000 to 3,000 low-ranking soldiers on the USS Carl Vinson. And this is part of the, the appellate record indicating how thorough of a search that they had done on this. And remarkably, maybe not remarkably, if you know as much about bite marks as I do or the folks up here do, it won't be that remarkable to you, but he was Keith was flagged for additional screening as somebody that would have fit this general description as a white male and um, a seaman and had teeth that apparently they thought were good for it. But then when they took a look at it, he was actually excluded by the dentist as a potential perpetrator of these particular bite marks. So they moved on. Five months passed. And they're starting to get a lot of pressure because as you know, the sensational facts of this case, you can imagine that there was a lot of pressure to solve a case like this. That somebody that was obviously a vicious murder, rapist, out loose, and um, five months ago, the Commonwealth started to get complaints that, from a senator that they've been dragging their feet. Then the pressure became very, very high to solve this crime. And we see this in a lot of wrongful conviction cases, is that you get very, very sympathetic, sensational victims, sensational crimes, and a, a lot of pressure to solve them, and not a lot of good evidence. The, we got a letter from senators um, indicating three different senators, um, Alphonse D'Amato, remember him? He wrote about the, this case, about it as well. And so the pressure came such that all the local police became aware that they were looking for essentially a biter. And for the pop psychologists and all of us, you know what I mean? And none of us can really help that. Anybody who's involved in a case investigation, you feel like, oh, well, it's a biter, right? So you, like, in many of the wrongful convictions around bite mark evidence, we've had somebody who's like an ex-girlfriend or somebody will come in and say that the defendant was a biter, that he liked to bite during sex or something like that. And so therefore, you have a compulsion to bite people, and therefore, you're a biter, right? This is total nonsense. It's based on no research or anything. It's just all of our own intuition, which often fails us. So Mr. Harwood, this is the, the got into a domestic dispute with his girlfriend at the time. She hit him with a pan. Mr. Harwood was accused of biting her. They end up down at the uh, courthouse being arraigned, and amazingly, and it's amazing just how easy it is to get a conviction when you're going to use scientific, alleged scientific evidence, is that they took the victim down to the courthouse for the arraignment to watch Mr. Howard in handcuffs being arraigned, knowing that she, he's a biter, right? And she still didn't identify him. 
and they still went forward with the case. So they revised their opinions. So this is the opinion that the dentist gave before, right? And just like something that I, I, I wanted to highlight for you as far as the slide is that the cognitive bias met metastasizing in the heads, right? Is that now we have a suspect and you can watch how rare is it that you can see these types of biases in action and on in black and white where it's actually written down. But this was the original opinion, right? So he checked out, they were negative. And then they had more talks. They looked at the pictures more closely. They studied them real hard. And they, had, uh, they thought they were life size. They needed to be readjusted. They readjusted it and said, you know, we think that Mr. Harward's good for it now. Two defense experts also agreed, right? So they, this is a letter from one of Mr. Harward's lawyers who showed up for your exoneration. He tried his best, you know, I think, right? What are your, what are your thoughts about your defense at trial? Well, the first one, they were out of their water. You know, they, they had no clue what was going on. It was a capital case, you know, and, and court-appointed attorneys, you get what you get. Uh, they, they tried their best, but they, they, couldn't, they couldn't fight City Hall, I guess you'd say because they didn't have the resources, because it was us, me and the two lawyers, against the city and the state of Virginia and, uh, and all our resources. And it was, it was just impossible. They were just overwhelmed. You know, it was like they, they had no clue. They never did a, a capital case before, and, you know, that's a death penalty, so that's a kind of important thing. Uh, it wasn't time to me. And you know, they just didn't know how to go about it. They didn't know what to do. And then when it comes up to the odontologists, which were gods and experts, self-appointed, uh, they, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't fight against it because that group of people, the odontologists that, that testify bite mark cases, uh, have each other's back. They won't step out from each other's uh, her view and say, okay, no, I don't, I don't think that's true because if they did, then they would lose the possibility of testifying at trials, getting per diem, nice hotel rooms, and having their ego stroke. We'll talk a little bit more about the trial in a minute. So, but just to, to go back, you know, when I, when I first got involved in the case, I called the trial attorney just to get their thoughts on it, you know what I mean? And it was amazing, he was an old man, and certainly he remembered the trial. And he was like, but, but the bite marks, he was like, they fit right in. He's like, what are you talking about? Like, That's not good science. And he was still, you know, he was totally persuaded 30 years later. The, uh, so the trial. The, um, she testified um, about this horrible ordeal. And, and like any other, you know, any of those of us who have tried cases before, when you have a case like this, that it's going to be very, very difficult to defend, even if you had had my bosses on the case the, um, is because is that you have somebody who's been the victim of a really horrible crime and they have, you know, led scientific evidence. But she testified and that somebody was standing over her bed and they bit her on the legs and that the perpetrator wore uh, a Navy uniform like Mr. Harward had and then he left numerous marks and she said that the attacker bit him, bit her. So. This is how we've seen, and I've seen these, and I've been involved in seven bite mark exonerations, and I've only been at the Innocence Project for about six years. The, um, so I read this type of testimony a lot, and not just in bite mark cases. I've seen them in a lot of other disciplines that lack a foundation, of scientific foundation. And I'm gonna walk you through how this happens. The, this is Dr. Lowell Levine. Um, Dr. Levine has been proven wrong at least one other time in the Edmund Burke case at the time, and still today is an active member of the ABFO and one of the most prominent bite mark experts in the world. So when you're getting, um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the trial process, when you're getting qualified as an expert witness, talk about how it felt to, to get that man on the stand and start listing these credentials. Well, it, it, it. He convinced me that I did it uh, because once he gave his credentials, and I've said this many times, even before my case was even, my name was even mentioned, I was convicted. I was done. The uh, jury, because in this country a judge wouldn't allow 
someone to come in and be an expert unless they knew what they were talking about. The, the jury was just, they, they were through. Once, once he said he was this, that, and the other, uh, part of the New York State this, and he was on the Mingale case, he testified at Ted Bundy's case, bite mark evidence and stuff, that was it. They could have cut the lights off and just hauled me off to prison because they were, they were convinced I was guilty. So, you know, to try to fight that uh, when you have no other expert witness that would step out of the darkness and the light says, well, maybe that's not true, other odontologists, which they don't do, uh, at the time they didn't do it. Uh, it, it was overwhelmed, it, it makes you think, wow, how, how is this possible when you're innocent? You know, I, I know I didn't do it, but he's making it fit. He's cutting the corners off of that square peg to get in that round hole. And the jury, you know, they were just, they were gaga over it. It was, as I've said before, it was, it was kind of like the Wizard of Oz. Uh, smoke and mirrors, you know, with his pointer and a big four by six black and white photographs and things and pointing out, well, this matches that. And, Here's the, the tooth is turned and it fits here. I was done. I, it was over with. So the, uh, I remember speaking to your brother um, on the, the day that you were released and, and saying that, you know, who always believed in your innocence and knew you were innocent, but that what he was listening to this testimony that I'm about to review with you started to develop his own doubts. You know, how, how was it that his teeth got on, on the victim? You know, I mean, it's, uh, and so, and what, what, and what I have this word conflated here is that and one of the really pernicious aspects of forensic odontology is that there are valid areas for these forensic dentists in which to work. When you hear about uh, a victim's remains being identified through their dental records, that's victim identification work. And, and Peter and Mary have actually done that type of work. And, the, uh, and essentially what that is is that you have all 32 teeth you have a complete record of those teeth. You have a closed population of, of like a plane crash goes down, right? And we know the people are missing. We know they're dead. We're going to look at, you know, did this person have on teeth 16 a gold cap, right? And you say, ha, ah, I think this is the guy, right? It may not be rocket science. And the way that Peter does it, it's rocket science. But, the, but it's science and it works, right? You know what I mean? And you can do that. And so what you get in these expert um, voir dires is a conflation of these subdisciplines to try to bootstrap one subdiscipline into another to kind of lump it all together is a valid and reliable evidence. And so what you'll have here is that, you know, there's these types of, of credentials where he's, you know, a consultant with the New York State Medical Examiner Office, the Nassau County's Examiner Office, in New York State's. He's been a consultant for the airlines and aviation accidents, and he's been the National Transportation Board, and for the Department of Justice, and the Joseph Mengele case, the Philadelphia Special Investigations Commission. The, he's been a consultant for the government of Argentine, the National Transportation Safety Board, for the training for the district attorneys for the National College of District Attorneys. He's published articles. He's published two textbooks. He's trained with the FBI police. We trained all 700 members of that particular investigation portion of the state police. He's taught Bart Mark courses in Costa Rica, the dentists, and police agencies. My God, right? I mean, it's Albert Einstein on the stand, and this is the voir dire from the defense attorney who was still convinced later. After all that, it goes on for pages, right? He's got one question, right? That is one question. Amazing. So. The next step, right, he's qualified as an expert witness, and now we're going to take all the assumptions that Peter and Mary finally tested, and he's going to assert that these are scientific facts, the fundamental assumptions underlying bite mark evidence. And you will get this testimony today. I'm going to be doing a Daubert hearing in March where we're going to have experts get on the stand and say exactly this today. So this is not ancient history. This is contemporary jurisprudence. This is happening right now involved in two capital cases where the prosecution is still trying to admit this evidence to identify a suspect. So it's based on the fact that everybody has a set of teeth which are unique and individual to that particular person. That's a fact. Class characteristics that, and, they, and notice how when you're talking about the way that the uniqueness of teeth is that he's not talking about it on skin, right, the way that the actual interpretation is done. He's talking about it on a piece of cheese and in styrofoam, right? 
where you might actually be able to get some good information from a bite and a piece of cheese, right? Because it doesn't heal, it doesn't swell, it doesn't stretch. It's not involved in a violent struggle, right? It's a piece of cheese. So another way to conflate those types of assumptions. And then you're going to go on to that they reproduce this skin to skin, wax to wax, and back and forth and back and forth. It's always permanent, and you can be transferred from one to the other. Then he's going to say that one discrepancy rule, right? This is something that's true with a lot of pattern matching techniques. And you'll get this kind of conflated testimony where they'll be bootstrapping. You know, it's just like tool marks and fingerprints and these others. And if we get one discrepancy, one that we can't explain, we exclude, right? We stop our analysis. Then you're going to talk about Mr. Harward's teeth, right? and that there were special and unique teeth of his. And I've seen this in every single one of these cases that I've worked on. They've talked about just how unique one particular aspect of this dentition was, or he had buck teeth, or this one was rotated 90 degrees in this way that I had maybe 1% of the cases, something like that, right? You'll get that type of testimony every single time. And then um, you, know, you talk about the wear patterns and the twisting and the turning and the things that are in and out and from the straight, and those are all individual characteristics, right? Even if that were true, that those, none of those characteristics would ever transfer to skin. None, right? So you just have this idea that, that teeth are unique, and you're trying to conflate that into uniqueness as if it were a DNA test, right? That's the really ins insidious aspect of this testimony is that because also it plays on this idea that we all have, that we're all unique, special snowflakes, right? Every piece of a thing that falls off our body is unique to us and us alone. And that's just not true, right? We're not. And <clears throat> you get a lot of that in these, right? And so then you get uniqueness, and then you're going to declare a match, right? And you can say you can literally take his dentition, and it will fit right on the money. And if you've ever watched this in practice, and you've ever seen it in person, like bite mark evidence is kind of like watching a cloud, right? And then you two of us together, right, and Keith would be looking at the sky and say, Keith, can you see, doesn't that look like an elephant? Oh, yeah, that does look like an elephant, right? And then Mary will say, well, I think it actually looks like a bunny. Oh, yeah, it does look like a bunny, right? That's what bite mark analysis is like. And it's also true because then in a few minutes, it'll look different. Same way bite marks will, right? Because it'll have healed or it'll stretch. Or it'll be in a different angle, right? It's very, very similar. So he goes on. And then he calls Mr. Howard, or Mr. Harward. I call you, there's, we have, sorry about that. My, sadly, we have an innocent client on death row whose name is Eddie Lee Howard, I, uh, who was also put there by bite mark evidence. And so I hope someday I'll be back up here and he'll be sitting where you are. And uh, so he condemned Mr. Harward with that testimony. And so then in cross-examination, once you've sat and you've listened to this as a defense attorney, where are you going to begin, right? And then this person was clearly befuddled, right? Talk about his cross-examination. Do you remember it? It was very short. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of remember because I was overwhelmed by the whole thing. But, uh, yeah, it, 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 it had nowhere to go. I mean, how, how can you, you know, fight the sun when it's staring you in the face? I mean, it, it had nothing to work with because at that time it was – you know, the few cases that were used, it was accepted and then, you know, put on top of that the fact that uh, he had such great credentials, uh, Levine did, that it, it was just overwhelmed. I mean, how do you do that? How, how would a person deal with that overwhelming factor? Uh, it, was, it was... He's going to get up there and say, that, well, that's not an elephant. Yeah. He's yeah. Like, I'm the expert, right? Right. That's an elephant. <laughs> the... Uh, so he's, he's kind of admitting this right at the beginning. And so what you get, and you'll see this in forensics all over, and, and for those of you who are practitioners or critical thinkers of any kind, is that when you hear the words training and experience that come to mind, your antenna for BS should go up, right? Is that training and experience is, they, is fine, it's good, we should all have both, right? But if you don't get any uh, feedback, about how your experience is actually, is it making you better at what you do? If your training doesn't give you any feedback, it doesn't make you better at what you do. If you have no way to measure how often you're getting it right, how often you're getting it wrong, and if your experience isn't causing you to become overconfident and take shortcuts, then it's meaningless, 
right? And so you really need to unpack somebody's training and experience. But when you have those kind of credentials, it'd be overwhelming, like tidal wave of credentials like that, it's very hard to undo. But what's true then and what's true today is that bite mark experts don't even take proficiency tests. Literally, they have no idea when they come into court how often they've been right or how often they've been wrong. They count it up by number of convictions versus number of wrongful convictions. So we're doing great, right? We have thousands of convictions and like this handful of people that the Innocence Project says they're innocent. And so what you have is that it's immediately when you when you seize on intuition that we all know this idea that skin you know has variables that change. And so that's what the defense attorney had to work with. So he's saying, well, you know, my training experience, you know, unfortunately you have to leave common sense at the door, right? It's due to the fact that this tooth is lower and it's hanging all the way down and it hasn't left a mark, you know, it's particularly, you know, it's not exclusive in anything. And that doesn't make sense to you, but trust me, I've seen hundreds of these cases. And I think, as you said, this is the first one that you've seen. This is him talking to the defense attorney, right? Keith Howard's life is on the line. It's a death penalty case. And we've got this guy saying, well, the tooth doesn't hang down. That's why you can't see that mark, right? So he can explain almost anything, like a cloud formation. And then finally, you're going to bring it back around. To, so remember all those dental IDs that I made, right? I identified Joseph Mengele's body, right? It's the same thing. It's all just comparing a known to an unknown. Nothing to see here. Then on redirect, any points that were made? And uh, John mentioned this, this phrase that, that if the National Commission on Forensic Sciences accomplished anything, maybe they did away with this particular nonsensical phrase to the reasonable degree of scientific certainty. Well, it means that he's very, 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 very high degree of probability, right? It's a very scientific answer. And that, you know, if you look hard enough, could you find somebody with similar teeth? Theoretically, even? I sincerely doubt it. In theory, I haven't examined everybody in the world, so I guess it's an abstract theory, you know, it might exist. It's a practical thing, the answer is no. How many people have you examined? Probably thousands of sets of teeth. Have you cross-compared them? You're always doing that. That's a lie, right? What he's talking, that is a lie, you know, and he can sue me. I'm, I'm ready for his discovery for sure. The idea that you're doing pairwise comparisons and bite marks is nonsense, right? And so the idea that he has a record in his mind about all the different bite marks and teeth that he's looked at is nonsense, right? We ran into this with the hair microscopy case audit with the FBI crime lab, right? And the idea that you would know the interior characteristics of a shaft of hair, how thick an ovoid body is, or the pigment, de uh, uh, pigment density, some of the other characteristics that were used to associate two hairs together, you'd also get testimony that said, well, I have examined thousands and thousands of hairs, and I have never been able to not to distinguish between two of them, right? And so the idea was, you know, okay, well, then they must be unique. Right, and we know from 75 wrongful convictions that that's not so. And so then finally he says that he's excluded everybody else who might possibly have done this. And that's it. So in total, you think back to Keith's case, six forensic dentists got it wrong. Six, all of these people are responsible for Keith Harward spending 34 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. All six of them were wrong. Not a single one of them has ever apologized. Not a single one. Nobody from the ABFO has ever been sanctioned for a wrongful conviction. Nobody has ever had a, a case audit done. Nothing has ever been done about any of this. And not a single court has ever excluded this evidence. Not one. So step nine, remember we're doing the anatomy of a wrongful conviction. John touched on this a little bit uh, before and I gave a talk here once just about the jurisprudence around some of our discredited scientific evidence. And what's sad and true is that there on the bottom of the right hand corner, 
is in this, you know, and, and I wish I had brought the, the Dauber motion with me that I have right now today, but the first line in the opposition from the state in this case is that make no mistake that the defense is asking you to overturn 50 years of precedent, right? And this is like the Commonwealth argues that all jurisdictions which have addressed the issue have held such evidence admissible after finding technique scientifically sound and reliable. That's true. It's an accurate argument without question. And then at the same time, you're going to use this junk science to uphold the conviction, right? The weakest conviction, the one that sounds like he's innocent when you're reading the appellate record, but they're gonna say, hey, it fit right in there, fit right on the money to a reasonable medical certainty Mr. Harward had convicted this. And that was it. You know, talk about your parents' testimony at the, your sentencing. Well, that's what kept me from getting a death penalty was uh, uh, my mother and father begging for my life. Uh, first time I ever saw my father cry because uh, he was a pretty strict, stern person, a great human being, but you know, I was facing a death penalty, and I had two odontologists that were willing to be paid to have me murdered by the state without question. They weren't scared, wanting me at, or had no conscience. They were willing to have me murdered by the state. And, and lucky for me, I guess you'd say, uh, the fact that my parents got up there and begged for my life was probably what got me a life sentence for a crime that actually was not committed you know, that's why it was overturned for the fact that the this, this statute did not read as what the crime was, but the judge at times said, well, okay, we'll just go ahead and let it go, and we'll let the appellate court decide what they're going to do about it. And, of course, the appellate court overturned it, and I was retried again with the same evidence and for, for first-degree murder and received the same, the same penalty. So it was, you know, the same thing over again, but... Uh, that's probably the reason why I, I, I'm here today is because I did not receive the death penalty because uh, it'll probably be too late by the time the Innocence Project got involved. Yeah, it's chilling, right, to be convicted of a capital murder and then have your parents begging for your life as an it'd be chilling if you were guilty. I. Uh, It's it's uh, it's difficult to imagine. The testimony that you saw was from the second trial, and it was actually Keith who noted this. You know, this is kind of the classic technicality of a reversal because it really was a technicality that you were um, got another shot at a trial. It was um, because you at the time the Virginia statute you couldn't get the death sentence if um, for a rape and a murder. It was you know in other words. If you, if you rape one person and murder the other, you weren't eligible, right? And so they, needless to say, they fixed the statute, but um, not in time for Keith. So I, um, when I got uh, um, the appellate decision, I went um, and had our paralegal go and take a look at our, um, we have 8,000 people waiting for our help at the Innocence Project. And I said, do you know, go and see if Mr. Harward has written to us. And he had something like, I'm all right, I'm ashamed to admit how long, like 10 years earlier or something. I, I don't, yeah, something, something like, that. like that, right? And, you know, so I was just at, a, at the American Academy of Forensic Sciences conference last, uh, last week, and uh, there was Bite Mark Expert giving a talk, and, and he was saying that all the problems had been fixed with Bite Marks because they hadn't had any really recent wrongful convictions, right? And I, I because he wouldn't take any questions, I wasn't able to point out that, you know, Mr. Harward waited 35 years for our help, you know what I mean, and, and took 10 years, and the reason that it got even to my desk is because I had our paralegal go take him out of the queue. I was like, that's an innocent guy, and we gotta get that case on our desk. And so, and I know that, that we talk about Frank Green's reporting and, and how important the media was. Well, Frank Green is uh, the head writer for the Richmond Times Dispatch, which is in Richmond, Virginia, which is the capital. And the capital, the, the biggest part of the people that work there are congressmen and senators and legislators. And because of his 
bulldogging this story. And, and the day that I found out I was being exonerated, I was reading the second article of that day in the newspaper. Uh, he, he sweated some people. And the politicians realized, hey, you know, we, we got something wrong here. We got to get behind this and correct it quick or we will look bad. Uh, I was the historically the fastest person ever to be exonerated in the state of Virginia. Uh, they, they filed the paperwork on, on March, I think it was 5th, and April 8th I was standing in a parking lot doing a press conference that day. So it was less than a month. It usually it takes months and months and months. Uh, the Attorney General even got behind it, uh, got on television and s said, we got it wrong, we got to get this guy out. But Frank Green, uh, he's another one of my heroes, just like uh, Chris is and all the people at the Innocence Project and Skagden Arps out of D.C. who did the pro bono work on my case. Uh, he kept throwing it at him. I mean, it was so, so stinking obvious because what we found out, the Innocence Project found out, uh, once they found, 30-some years later, found a rape kit and evidence from the trial, which, you know, is overwhelming in that fact. You know, everything for a reason, but... They stayed on it, stayed on it, kept saying, well, yeah, if you got anything, got anything. Finally, one day, person said, yeah, we got something in the back with his name on it. We didn't know if it was just old Christmas decorations or something. They just reused the box. But lucky for me, uh, there was a rape kit and several other things in there, plus the bench notes. I guess you're going to talk about the serologist. And I wasn't. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, and uh, the facts of the case are uh, it's been uh, – stated by uh, another attorney from Skagen Arps that I had the trifecta of things that could go wrong in a case. Uh, the shipyard guard that identified me, we found out, had been hypnotized. After he was first uh, spoken to and interviewed, it was a different time and different situation altogether, but once he was hypnotized, and then it turned out it was me he saw. Uh, they also had a serologist, and this was in the evidence they found, a serologist studies blood, and he was hired by the state to, uh, uh, there was no DNA back in 82 and 83, but there was blood type. And he testified at both trials saying he had no blood type that he could, you know, type from, A, O, B, whatever. Everybody's got a blood type. Everybody knows the difference, and most people know their own. Well, come to find out, he did find a blood type, and it was type O. I'm type A. Uh, and he lied at two trials saying he didn't have any. So there you have a situation to where somebody's paid by the state to step up and do, uh, to testify at a trial, and all he's doing is trying to make a little bit of money and earn his keep. But because of that, Virginia has taken his, his cases, they, right after my situation, they found one other case that he did some bad stuff on, and his, all his cases are being reviewed, and they keep putting off for some reason. It was supposed to be like August of... 2016 that he was the, the, the summation or whatever it is, the study was supposed to come out, but they keep, as a state does, they keep putting it to the back because there's no glory in that and there might be cases that they will have to deal with that were wrongfully done, such as my case. Uh, so, you know, they're, they're, that in the odontology uh, is it, just it's just surprising, and I didn't know any of this, and my de defense attorneys didn't know any of this. That was kept from them, you know, and I think that's Brady violation. None of this was turned over. So, uh, you know, once again, how can you fight a court case if you don't have all the evidence? And what little evidence you have is made up, the odontology part of the bite mark situation. I mean, it's, it's, it's all crap, you know, it's all made up, and it's, it's all for their glory and their ego. And, it, it is, and and that's what bothers me the most about that is the fact that it still goes on. How many times do you have to be shown it's wrong before you agree it's wrong? And that gets to the ego and the fact that, you know, when cases are overturned or exonerations, wrongful convictions, they very seldom say, oh, we made a mistake, we're sorry. It hadn't happened in my case at all. And in most cases, it doesn't. And that's another part of the problem we have with wrongful convictions is that nobody's feet is being held to the fire. And why is that? 
because the foxes are guarding the hen house. They are in charge. And until something like that happens, it's going to continue to happen. Because, and I've said this many times, and I'm sorry if there's some prosecutors in the audience, but a prosecutor to be a prosecutor has to prosecute. And therein lies a the problem. They're not elected and they're not hired for the cases that, oh no, we're not gonna try that person because they're innocent. I got 85% conviction rate. I'm gonna be your prosecutor. So to continue with that line of work and that type of skill set, you've got to prosecute. So there's gonna be some, some things done that's not correct. And until those people can be held accountable you know, the only thing you can do is, is sue now. And those people don't pay. The insurance companies and the great people, taxpayers of that state are the ones that pay, just like in my case. My compensation did come from the legislators or the judge or the detectives or all those other people that il did illegal things. They were the criminals, not me. I did not commit a crime. I wasn't the best person in the world, but I did not do it but I, I, I did the time, I didn't do the crime. But they're, they're not held responsible. And that's something that should be looked into and should be done. It's, humans are involved, there's always gonna be problems. There's always gonna be somebody doing wrong things and mistakes are made. But until you tell these people and show them, okay, you're gonna be responsible for this conviction, they're not, they don't care. It's just a job. It's just something they do. And if they want to continue to have a good conviction rate, they're going to continue to do bad things in some cases. Not all are wrong. Not all are bad. And I've had good prosecutors come to me and say, you know, I'm embarrassed by this. This is what I do. And all it takes is one bad prosecutor to make the rest of them look bad. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it is. Because, you know, it's an old boys club and just like odontologists, they're going to stick together and watch each other's back. And they're not going to admit when they're wrong. Because they just don't. They just won't. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> you're a tough act to follow, Mr. Harward. The, uh, um, I will say that the, the prosecutor in this case who was ultimately the elected prosecutor, uh, Glenn Howard, in um, Newport News, was very cooperative and um, did the right thing in right. this case. I, uh, so I want to um, make sure I mention that. I mean, it was remarkable you talk about the evidence search. You know, I mean, so many of our cases, that's the whole case, is searching for the evidence. And we had uh, my legal fellow, Zay Emanuel, um, who had spent, I don't know, six months digesting your trial record and knew it in and out, right? And so he just picked up the phone and called up the, uh, the courthouse, the appellate courthouse, and said, uh, yeah, we were representing uh, Keith Harward. We're wondering if you have any stuff from this trial. And he's like, they got off. Yeah, there's a box here, right? He's like, <laughs> it says rape kit. Right. Like, yeah, hold on to that. Right? So hold on to that. It was incredible. It was, uh, um, yeah, and you were in pretty bad shape physically. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, uh, so we got this. We found the kit, um, and then when we felt like it was really going to happen is that they uploaded <coughs> um, the DNA. There was, you know, there was DNA all over the crime scene and it says, and in, in actually in the appellate dis the decision, it indicates how much biological evidence is likely exists. And it hit on um, this man, um, Crotty, Howard Crotty. Um, no, Jerry Crotty, I'm sorry. The, uh, and it's kind of interesting that they those pictures they look kind of similar. I don't, uh, but the um, I'm sorry about that picture, Keith. And I hate it. <laughs> I was right? sick. Of so, that. <laughs> he was right. I That's went, how I went really well. I, uh, and um, Jerry Crotty died in prison. Um, he had died in prison about six years before um, Mr. Harward was exonerated. He had, uh, was there on a kidnapping charge. Um, and so after that, the. Uh, Frank Green wrote a series of articles, and as you know, Keith said, it became you know a fast-moving train. Suddenly, I was up uh, at uh, giving a talk like this at a conference, and suddenly, 
um, this man, the Attorney General, was on the news and uh, admitting that they had gotten it wrong. And those of you who have litigated in Virginia just know how quite rare that actually is. And then exoneration. Um, it was really one of the most moving moments that I can remember. Um, tell us about the when we were all sitting, waiting for the night before and the day of your release. Well, it was nerve wracking to me because we didn't know, we were expecting it to be months down the road. And then they contacted me and told me, you need to go to medical. So I went to medical and, and they said, well, you're spending the night. And I said, no, I'm not. You know, I don't need to stay over here. I spent some time in medical because I had an illness and stuff. And I said, that's the walking dead in the back. I'm not staying here. Not this is the one and only time, and I hope it would be the one and only time I ever say this. I told I want to talk to my attorneys. And, and a, a lieutenant came in. She, she told me, calm down, calm down. You'll find out what's going on. So I sat there for a little while, and then next thing you know, they took the handcuffs off of me. See, when you're medical, they 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 waist chain you, so you can't attack anybody in medical because, believe it or not, the the medical care is not that good in prison, and a lot of people retaliate by beating up doctors and nurses and things. But you know they're already in prison because they they're not right thinking people. Uh, so. She took the handcuffs off of me and walked me up past this line that you do not cross unless you want to get shot. And next thing I went in the admin building, sitting in an office with, uh, or a conference room with carpet and big back chairs and nice big table and stuff. And the ward walked in and shook my hand and said, Mr. Harvard, you're now a free man and I can't allow you to be in prison because you'll be a security risk to me. They were afraid I would be attacked or something because I was exonerated. Meanwhile, on TV, everybody's watching it. You know, this going on, I was nowhere around the TV, so I didn't even know. And then after they said, well, okay, well, we've got to get your paperwork together and this, that, and other, and tomorrow we're going to release you. Uh, and by the way, there's going to be a press conference at 1 o'clock. I just spent three decades in prison. I've never done a press conference, so that was a wild idea. I didn't get a bit of sleep. I, all, all that I did all night long was pace. And think about what I was going to say, because I've never done this before. Uh, you know, the, the fact that I was going to be a free man, uh, I knew I was going to be because these great people were going to make sure of that. But we thought it was going to be a while. It was just, it was just so, so overwhelming. And then I walk out in the parking lot, and there's like 30 journalists out there from all around the state of Virginia and D.C. and that type of thing. And it was just, it was just, it was just overwhelming. Uh, just you know, and, and they were asking questions and taking pictures and things like that, and I wasn't even there. I, w I was somewhere else. I was, you know, it's just you, people say to me all the time. If, it's always three things they say to me when they find my story. The first thing is they say they're sorry, and I tell them it's not my fault. It's those. It's not their fault. It's the criminals in Newport News that had me convicted, and that's what they are the prosecutor and the judge and the detectives because they conspired and fabricated this case, uh, 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 that I lost my train of thought for a second. Three things that you say when you say they're sorry. Right, and they always uh, say, uh, uh, you know, what's the first thing you're going to do? And I don't know. And the last thing they always say to me is, is that if some of a bitch is going to pay you some money. And that's an important fact I want you people to understand. I spent 33 years of my life in prison. Some states don't offer compensation whatsoever. Oh, of course they're not going to apologize. And compensation is something few and far between, and that should be a federal law, you know, because those criminals in Newport News caused me to lose more than half my life. I went in when I was 26 years old. I got out when I was 60. Do the math. This year, I'll be five years in the hole before I'll have more years out than I did in. Uh, so I lost a lot. But people should be compensated that were wrongfully convicted. They should be, it should be something federal. It should be something that's just a law. They won't even apologize, so you forget about the money. But I was lucky enough that the state saw a federal lawsuit coming because I had all kind of things that I could sue them on you know, a wrongful conviction, Brady, 
uh, all this all this other stuff that was involved that was done to me uh, and they quickly uh, uh, put in a bill and had a bill passed through the legislature to take care of me uh, to get me out of the way but I have to tell them I said well you know some people aren't lucky like I am other states don't do it at all some states do it automatically as soon as you walk out the door they hand you a check to get you going. So Virginia doesn't even do anything. I don't know what this state does. I have no clue. But so I'm hitting the street with nothing. What am I supposed to do? And what do most criminals that get uh, parole do? You know, they get a few hundred dollars. They're put in a parking lot and they say, see ya. And what are they to do? You, you can't rent a house on three or $400 a month, you know? So they're going to return back to crime. That's right, recidivism is so big. They're going to go back to do what they're doing. But that's something altogether different I talk about. But uh, uh, people just automatically apologize. And it's not their fault, and that's the great thing. And they also say, and this is the other thing, they always say, I cannot imagine. Thank you very much, but you cannot. None of you can, can imagine what it is. And to have your country your judicial system to do this to you, the greatest country in the world, it should, it should make you pause and think, wow, what can we do to correct this? And imagine me getting out behind bite mark evidence, which is nonsense, and to know even in this state there's a case ongoing that bite mark, is, bite mark evidence is going to be used. How many times? Not if we can help it. Pardon me? Not if we can help it. True. How many, how many times is wrong wrong? If it's wrong, it's not right. And, 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 and as Chris said, it's, you know, it's allowed another trial, so we could go, go forth with it. Where are the judges in this? They're the gatekeepers. Why can't they stop it? Why can't they say, okay, let's, re let's rely on reliable evidence. Let's go, you know, let's don't go with clouds. Let's go with real stuff. And now after uh, Donald Trump got elected and Sessions is his attorney general, I was the first, one and only exoneree to ever attend the National Commission on Forensic Science. National Commission on Forensic Science, DOJ in Washington, D.C. That very morning I showed up to talk about what happened to me. They shut it down. And these were people like uh, Peter and Mary, scientists, doctors, attorneys, judges, that get together and they say, okay, well, if we're going to use this, we need to make guidelines. We need to make sure this stuff is, is good and it works. But now, since they shut it down, that does not happen and it's left up to the prosecutors. Wow. I'm just, a, I'm, I'm a high school graduate. That's all I am. I'm not a smart person. I'm just a high school graduate. But in my head, it's like, wow, how is this possible that they would shut this down and stop the people that need to be getting together and studying these things and making the rules and regulations so I don't happen? But it continues to this day. In this very state, they're going to use bite marker evidence. It's wrong. It's wrong, it's wrong, but we're going to use it. It's wrong, we're going to use it. Wrap your hands around that for a minute. That's, that's kind of, kind of, I don't understand. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. Thanks, Keith. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you everybody for having us here tonight. It's an honor to be here with uh, Mr. Howard and to hear his story. Um, I'm gonna be speaking to you a little bit about what Peter and I have been doing in the area of science and bite marks. Um, I am a 
Associate Professor of Dentistry at SUNY at Buffalo um, Dental School. And when I became a, a new faculty member, one of the areas that we had to go into was um, independent research. And I decided to take my research angle into forensic dentistry. And there are really two main areas of forensic dentistry. The first is victim identification, and the second is bite mark identification. And one thing Peter and I said to ourselves is we are never going to touch bite mark identification because it is way too controversial. Lo and behold, I had a student come into my lab, asked to do a bite mark project, and I said, okay, Peter, I think we're gonna go ahead and start this. And what we learned was truly amazing. Uh, we came into this, we didn't know much about bite mark analysis. We did a lot of uh, literature searching on bite mark analysis and really found some eye-opening um, issues really wrong with bite mark analysis. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a little bit of background on what we've been doing, um, what the history has been, and really where is the science going or where should it be going. Before we go in, let's go over what the premises of bite mark analysis is, because I think it's important to have an idea of um, how bite marks are different from the other aspect of forensic odontology, which is victim identification. As Chris has alluded to, the notion of that the human dentition is unique, which is one of the main premises of bite mark analysis, gets really muddled with the other area of forensic odontology, which is victim identification. The thought is, well, if the teeth are unique enough for identification in an individual, how could they not be unique enough in the area of bite mark analysis? If we take a look at something like this. This is a set of dental x-rays, and I'll point out a couple of things for people in the audience who are not dentists. There are 32 teeth in the human mouth. There are combinations of teeth that are present, teeth that are absent. So you can see here in the x-ray, we do have teeth that are missing. So we're already starting out with combinations of teeth present, teeth missing. We also have the possible fillings that can be done. So we can have, as Chris said, gold caps on teeth. We can have um, tooth-colored fillings. We can have silver amalgam fillings. And we can tell all this by the x-ray when we take a look at it. If you take a look at this one tooth over here, we have three different fillings on one tooth. We also have the root morphology that's here. We have the bone trabecular pattern that's here. We also have sinus morphology that's here. So when we look at the totality of what we have in a set of dental x-rays, we have a lot of information to go on. So if we have to compare between two individuals, there is a lot of information here with which to be able to distinguish between people. Unfortunately, when we go to bite mark analysis, we lose almost all of that. What we are left with at the end of the day with bite mark analysis is really just the biting edges of the six front teeth. Sometimes we'll get a couple more teeth in the back, but really it is just the biting edges of the six front teeth. So all we have to go on is really just alignment pattern of those teeth, we lose everything else. The second premise is that the unique features transfer to the skin. Now in 2009, the National Academy of Sciences did put out its report I think what's important here is to look at the date that this came out. It came out in 2009. Bite marks had been in the courtroom for almost 40 years at this point. And if you can see what was determined by the NAS report in 2009, they say the uniqueness of the dentition has not been scientifically established. Okay, so the first premise, not scientifically established. The ability of the dentition, to, if you need to transfer to the skin, has not been scientifically established. The extent or scope of distortion has not been demonstrated. The effect of distortion has not been quantified. And there's no threshold of evidentiary value. So keep in mind, this has been in the courtroom for nearly 40 years with no scientific foundation with which to base this analysis on. So if we look at the scientific literature, and if we take a look at the graph here, this is total bite mark papers per decade. Okay, so if we take a look at the graphs here, this is per decade. The numbers along the side are not per 100 or per 1,000. These are 40. This is 50. This is 60. And those are total number of papers per decade. So yes, there has been a scientific lacking in the overall premises of bite mark analysis. These numbers get worse. If we take out the case reports, 
if we take out the evidence collection techniques, if we take out the photography techniques, do you want to use black and white photography? Do we want to use color photography? The numbers get far worse. So we can see how this drops down when we are just looking at empirical, hypothesis-driven research at this point. Now, there are issues with conducting bite mark research, and these are not unique to bite marks in and of themselves, but the first thing that we need to do is we have to have a scientist. It's a little bit more difficult in bite mark research because you really want to have a dentist as part of your research team, and most dentists are going to be private practitioners. We do have dentists that are involved in academia, but most dental researchers in, in academia are not doing forensic research. They're doing oral biology. They're doing um, new dental materials, um, ways to eradicate dental decay. And the reason why they're looking more into those aspects is because we have to have a funding source. Most of the dental funding sources, such as the NIH, um, NSF, do not fund forensic dental research. So there is a lack of funding coming in to attract a scientist now with, to do the research. We also need to have a facility, so you need to have a laboratory environment to do your research. The next two go hand in hand. You need to have a study design, and you also need to have a model with which to use. Scientific research and bite mark analysis, I mean, obviously you cannot duplicate a violent altercation on a human being. So you need to have an analog with which to create your bite marks on. We chose cadaver skin. There's been other studies that have used pig skin. They've used wax and so forth. And we'll go over some of those. And then finally, we need to have publication. We need to disseminate the information once we have the project completed. Now, even though we did start our bite mark research probably about 2008, when we first started actually doing our literature searches to get into our projects, um, we did find some studies that did go back very early into the 1970s. Now, I don't know if these studies were either ignored, they were forgotten, or so forth, but they were readily available on a literature search. One of the first ones we came up with was in 1971, Dr. DeVore did a bite mark study not a sophisticated study by any means, but what he did is he had human subjects and he had cadavers. And what he did is he used ink circles on his subjects. And all he did was simply move the body parts. Because it only stands to reason that if you are in a violent altercation and you're struggling with somebody, body parts are going to be moving. And what he found is that there was 60% linear expansion depending on how much he moved the body part. So he concluded that unless you know that exact position that that body part was in when the bite occurred, you're not going to be able to do your analysis with the amount of distortion that's happening here. And these are just with ink circles moving the body part. So even though this was, a, again, a simplistic study, it really did demonstrate a lot. His biggest conclusion is you really did need to know the orientation. But then he went further to extrapolate that techniques when comparisons are made by measuring spaces of teeth, widths, arch, arch curvature, et cetera, on models of alleged assailants and comparing them to any superimposition technique to size and shape of photographs taken of bite marks from the victim have been shown by this study to be invalid. Meaning that if you're already getting these results on a very simplistic level, that going to a more complex the, um, means of study is not going to really make things better. If your test is already failing on this level, it's certainly not going to improve if you make it more complex. 1975, Dr. Whitaker did make the study a little bit more complex. What he did is rather than using ink circles, he used actual um, teeth. He used a biting apparatus, and what he did is he created bites in wax and bites on pig skin. Now, we use wax a lot in dentistry. It holds its fidelity. We use it to make dental prostheses. So it is a very accurate recording medium. And what he found is when he made comparisons is that the accuracy ranged from about 96.5% to 95.5% in wax to 72% to 63% in pig skin. And these were under ideal laboratory conditions immediately after the bite. So we don't have any inflammatory reaction. Obviously, no, there's no swelling, there's no bruising, there's um, no movement of victim, nothing. These are ideal laboratory conditions. And then what he stressed is that in 25% of the cases, they could not correctly identify the biter under these conditions. One hour after the biting, the accuracy fell to 35%, and 24 hours to 16%. And then he extrapolates that bites on human skin may be similarly unreliable. 
And he also said he acknowledged that this could be different when we go to human skin. Obviously, pig skin is not human skin. It could have a different result. But again, if you're already failing your test under ideal laboratory conditions, there's nothing to make us think that when we go to a violent altercation where somebody is struggling, where we have a wound response, where we have swelling and we have bruising, that we're going to get a better result at this point. Peter and I came in and started doing our research around 2008. Our first paper came out into publication one month before the release of the 2009 NAS report. That came out in February. Our first paper came out in um, January. When we first started doing the research, we thought that we were going to look at the second principle. Do the unique features transfer to the skin? Because we thought if it doesn't transfer to the skin, it doesn't really matter if the dentition's unique, if we don't have the transfer. We did the majority of our studies on the skin first, and then we were just getting a little bit of backlash from the community that really still wanted to hold on to the notion, well, the dentition is still unique. So we decided to do the back end of our studies on the uniqueness of the dentition. So we'll go over a, a couple of the main hits with, with our research that we had. A very first study, what we did is we had one set of mounted study models. Actually, they were my models of my mouth. So we all had it with the same set of teeth, on an instrumented biting apparatus. So it was open to the same diameter, and we had a load cell on it, so it was all at the same pressure. So all of our bites were created under the same circumstances. The only thing that varied was the bitten um, body part. When we looked at our bites, we saw that none of them were, um, they were all visually dissimilar. And also when we measured them, we found that none were measurably the same. And the distortion was pretty significant. We found that the mesial to distal, or the length of the tooth, the distortion ranged from negative 29% to plus 5, with an overall range of 34. The arch width went from negative 27 to plus 24, overall of 51. And the angulation was significant. The angulation, or the curvatures between the teeth, went from negative 81 to positive 80. And the reason for this I'll get into in just a little bit, why some of the numbers are getting bigger and some of them are getting smaller. We found that the movement of the victim was um, really significant in the study because we really needed to know what position that was because as soon as we moved the body part, the distortion dramatically increased at that point. And really the underlying um, issue that we found is the skin properties were of paramount, paramount importance when you look at bite marks. We did do a lot of examination into the properties of the skin. And skin exists on our body in a state of, of pretension, meaning it's already stretched and it's stretched more in one direction versus the other. This follows something called Langer lines. Carl Langer um, determined this back in 1861, so this is not new research. And this is really born out of um, more so of the um, surgical research, because the surgeons have to know in which direction to cut the skin, because if they cut it in the wrong way, what's going to happen is the skin is going to scar more. So you can even test this on yourself. If you pinch your skin in one direction, it's going to be looser. If you turn it 90 degrees, it's going to become tighter. So skin is different in different directions. This alters with movement, and it alters between shapes of people and between sexes. So it does not stay static. So if I hold my arm in one way, my skin tension is going to be in one dimension, and if I move it, it's going to change. Again, violent altercation. This is going to change. This is why some of the bites were getting bigger, some were getting smaller, because the skin is tighter or looser, depending on which direction you're biting it. So we can take a look here. This is a cadaver leg. And what we did is we simply bit the skin. This is in one direction. Same set of teeth, same opening diameter, same pressure. This is what it looks like if I simply turn it. Okay, you can see a difference now between the shapes and sizes of these teeth just by simply t rotating this 90 degrees. And this is just an illustration of some of the bite marks that we created. And you can see, again, all with the same set of teeth. And I did put an illustrative example of what the shape of the actual teeth that created it next to each arch. So this does not represent opening diameter. I just put the top teeth next to the top bite and the bottom teeth next to the bottom teeth so you can make a comparison. And you can see here, there's definitely a malalignment pattern here. These are the lower teeth. It's almost straight here. We've got one tooth that's a little bit out of alignment. It's got an angle. But look at how much this angle goes out. And then just look at how different these patterns are. And again, this is just comparing between the same set of teeth, making multiple bites. And you can see how different these bites are. We took out a tooth and created a bite. Almost looks like there's two teeth here. 
So it almost looks like these are two big teeth. These are lower teeth. Could easily be confused maybe for the upper jaw, which is the bigger jaw. So even though we have a missing tooth, sometimes it could look like a missing tooth is present. And the practitioners acknowledge this. This is out of expert witness testimony in two trials that I have testified in where the opposing expert has said, no two bite marks that I've ever seen from the same biter on the same victim look the same. And they say they are surprised, they meaning me, when the same teeth make bite marks and they all look different. Well, we've known that forever. These are the practitioners acknowledging that bite marks are not repeatable. If you have one set of teeth and they're making different bite marks on the victim and you have multiple bite marks, which one are you gonna take? The one that most looks like the victim, the one that doesn't look like the victim, the one that kind of sort of looks like the victim. If you only have one bite mark, which one did you get? Practitioners know it, the research is also showing it. So we have to ask ourselves, is it repeatable? Meaning, is it reliable? And if it's not repeatable, can it be valid? Can the test measure what it's supposed to measure? Now, there were other studies that did look into this. Dr. Dorian also did the same studies on pig, found, again, similar um, results as far as distortion within his bites. Dr. Hermsen did a human study. He did get IRB approval or Institutional Review Board approval. In order to do these studies on human beings, you need to do them ethically. So the IRB has to approve your study. And because there's no preliminary work in bite marks, it's very limiting amount of uh, research you can do. And basically, he was very limited to what he could do. But again, it's a step in a more advanced model. His re uh, results were also showing what we did. You get a tremendous amount of distortion. Uh, and Dr. Johnson did a pig study. He was funded by the National Institute of Justice for a tune of about three quarters of a million dollars over three years. And I'm gonna show you what his studies found. He made 200 bite marks. And out of those, only between 43 and a half and 58% had sufficient detail for examination. So under his ideal laboratory conditions, only about 50% of the time could he even create a bite mark that had enough detail for examination. He had two examiners, investigator one and investigator two. Investigator one selected the correct dental models for the bite marks five out of 143 times. Investigator two did it twice out of 156. This is our accuracy rate, 0.035 and 0.0128. Now these results were not very good, so he decided to add another little bit of language here. Now I did review this for the National Institute of Justice for that granting agency, and I did encourage a little bit of correction before this was published. So he did decide to rank his models in the top 1%, 5%, 10%, so, and so forth. So he was able to put his study models into the, these percentiles and, and say, well, well, look, we can narrow it down. But really what does this show is how many false positives you can put in. He also stated that in more than 20% of the sample, this was language again, to make the results sound a little bit better. In more than 20% of the samples, the distance metric model found the target within the closest 5%. And in more than 6%, it found the target in the closest 1%. What that really means is that at 80% of the time, the model did not find the target to the closest 5%. And in 94% of the cases, it did not find it within the closest 1%. So again, you can see this three-year funded study to the tune of three quarters of a million dollars had poor results. We did do some examination into the uniqueness of the dentition. As I said, we decided to look into that after our skin studies were showing what they did and we were still getting pushback on, well, the dentition must surely be unique. We had a population of about 1,100 models. These were three-dimensional 3D scans, so we did look at this in length, width, and height. And what we found is um, we did a measurement error, meaning how many repeat measures could we make on the same specimen? What was our accuracy rate on that? And then we determined that we were going to define a match between individuals within this variability or our measurement error. It turned out to be pretty low. Across the whole area of the dentition, it was about 2%. So if we're looking at being able to distinguish between people with measurement error accuracy, it was about 2%. So if we look at this population of 1,100, and we look at the top teeth, which is the maxilla, or the bottom teeth, which is the mandible, 396 people had matches to at least one other individual in the sample population. Got a little bit lower on the lower jaw because we have a little bit more crowded and a little bit more malalignment. The top teeth tend to be a little bit straighter. 
So that's not surprising. But let's see what happens when we allow for distortion. Let's put in a distortion factor of 25%. Out of our 1,100 people, 826 now will find a match with somebody else in the sample population, 451 on the lower jaw. And look at what the numbers go up to when we go to 50 and 75%. We're taking it almost the entire sample population at this point with, with the top jaw and probably three quarters of it with the lower jaw by just allowing for distortion. <coughs> Now, the ABFO, or the American Board of Forensic Odontology, they are trying to make some strides. You know, with the newer um, members that are coming in, they are trying to help with making more guidelines and making more um, guidelines for their examiners to follow. But the problem is no guideline is going to take care of this problem if you don't have any support to the underlying fundamental premises. If that is not proven, no guideline is going to be able to help you make a determination. The bigger issue with that is apart from the foundational premises of bite mark analysis, there is going to be a bigger problem with bite mark analysis in of itself. And again, we can just go through these guidelines to say that they excluded having a bite mark, not excluded as having a bite mark, or it's inconclusive, and they go ahead and define the criteria with each. But if we drop it down to just the very basics, is it a human bite mark? Do teeth create this bite mark? It's not a human bite mark. Teeth did not create the bite mark, or it's inconclusive. This is now where we're starting to see the bigger foundational issue with bite mark analysis aside from the premises. If we take a look at an experimentally created bite mark, this is one that I made on cadaver skin. It looks like teeth. You can see arch shape. You can see wounds in the skin that look like teeth here. So if I were to ask you, is this a bite mark? I think we can pretty much say, yeah, that, that looks like a bite mark. But if you look at real bite marks, and you start to see what happens with the bruising and the tearing and the pulling of the skin, how many of these are bite marks and how many of these are not bite marks? The very basic question before you even do an analysis. So if we go and look at, can I go ahead and do the analysis on bite marks? We have to first determine that our wound is a bite mark. So they did a study. Dr. Freeman and Dr. Um, Ian Pretty sent out 30 to 39 members of the Board of Forensic Odontology 100 pictures of bite marks and asked them very basic questions. Is it a bite mark? Is it not a human bite mark? Is it suggestive of a human bite mark? And this is what they found. And I know this is a very busy slide, but you can take a look at the colors. The green is this is a human bite mark. The yellow is this is su suggestive of a bite mark. And red is this is not a bite mark. The results are all over the board. There is no examiner agreement if the wound is even a bite mark. So I think if we take a look at bite mark analysis in of itself, there's greater issues that, again, maybe render this um, area of forensic science is just unreliable, that you can't even determine that the wound is a bite mark, let alone do the examination on the wound <coughs> itself. Okay, I'm going to hand this over to Peter now, who's going to continue on. Just to reiterate that in Mr. Harward's case, there was no question that it was a bite mark. She testified that it was a bite mark, and there were six of them. So you think about that variable is eliminated. So I want to talk a little bit about the reception that the um, science has received. Um, and it's important to sort of think about who's looking at the science, right? We have the practitioners, the people that are invested in this, the lawyers, the attorneys, the prosecutors, defense attorneys, and the judges, which probably are the most important people. So are we looking at a shifting paradigm? Well, this is what I really do. This is actually what I do most days. Um, I'm an imaging scientist. This is a three-quarter million dollar microscope. It's a scanning electron microscope. And I take about 40,000 pictures a year with this thing. Okay? So I get pictures of bacteria, pollen grains, ceramics, metals. And every one of those 40,000 pictures, I want to try and ensure that there's a piece of scientific information, something useful in those pictures. So when you get confronted with something like this, I really have a problem. This is another exoneree, Stephen Mark Cheney from Texas. Um, looking at this image, I simply cannot believe, I cannot see anything in that image that would be individualizing. And this is, this is part of the, 
interesting thing that we've learned about um, joining the American Academy of Forensic Sciences, there are forensic dentists that go to this thing. They're sitting in the back of the room and somebody shows a picture like this and it's emperor's clothes. The guy up front saying, well, this is one in a million chances that this person made the bite mark, but where is it? Where's the detail? I simply don't see it. So this is why we were reluctant initially to get involved with, with bite mark research because to me, there's, there's simply nothing viable about it. Anyway, um, John and uh, Mary both talked about the NAS report, and uh, actually John did an interesting mixture of quotation from the NAS report and the PCAST report, and we'll get back to that in a little bit. But as Mary said, um, our first paper came out a month before the NAS report. The rest of them came out um, shortly after. I think we had five papers that year. And it was pretty clear to us at some point the lawyers would find those papers and we would be asked to go into the courtroom or at least they would present the papers in the courtroom. Well, I thought it would be about five years because that's the way science happens. And by the way, it takes about 18 months to publish a paper. So it's all a slow process, right? But anyway, that happened within months, not years. I got a call from a lawyer in a capital murder case in Alabama, the Veet case. It was an evidentiary hearing. It's not a Fry or a Dorbert state. And the Alabama precedent, the precedent in the Alabama, state of Alabama for bite marks was the Stinson case in Wisconsin. And Stinson was exonerated shortly before this Alabama hearing that we, that we had. Robert Lee Stinson is in jail for 23 years. And it just so happens that the prosecution witness, the bite mark expert that put him in jail, was the same guy that did the $775,000 study that showed nothing. So he actually put more than one person, I think, uh, wrong for conviction. But he got this money from the National Institute of Justice to try and prove that his bite mark analysis was valid, and it certainly didn't work. Well, the other thing in this case is that we thought we had another good thing going for us with the names of the uh, defense attorneys, the flood and threat. We thought that would have some effect, but as it turns out, um, what happened, uh, this is the bite mark. I mean, just look at that. It's, it's, it's just not credible, right, that you could make an identification from something like this. Well, this was interesting, too, because the, another exoneree, Ray Crone, a gentleman second from the right, um, is a very famous exoneration. He was the hundredth person exonerated from death row. Bite mark evidence convicted him. Um, he was invited to this hearing um, just as Keith um, might be to give the, his version of what happened and what it means to be wrongfully convicted. Um, and by the way, Mary, when I show this picture, Mary always says, so this is me on the far side there. And uh, there's something about this picture here, you know, when you're in forensics, you look carefully at things, right? So Mary noticed that you know, I must have been extremely nervous. This is right before the hearing was to start my first <laughs> testimony. I've left bacon on the plate, right? So <laughs> something's clearly wrong, right? <laughs> anyway, so um, this hearing in Alabama, in the middle of nowhere, um, this is the ABFO. They, their tactic was to send a delegation of diplomats, that's what they call themselves, to, in, in support of bite mark evidence, and in fact, what they're actually doing is trying to intimidate the other, the defense expert witnesses. So this is their tactic. And it turns out the guy that's third from the right is the person that, believe it or not, actually wrote the critical language in an NAS report that both John and Mary have been talking about. Mary showed the actual text. The text is critical of bite mark analysis, but here he is in support of bite mark evidence, and then we'll see him again later on. But this seemed to me to be the, the height of hypocrisy, you know, that this person would be doing this. My first opportunity to uh, testify, um, it was 110 degrees in Alabama that day, the air conditioning wasn't working in the courtroom, and the gentlemen were allowed to remove their jackets. Um, but I'm sitting in the witness box, and the perspective from the camera is where this delegation of ABFO people was sitting. So they were sitting in the jury box across from me. So what happened in the case, um, it was pretty interesting because I didn't testify about the bite mark evidence at all, not, not even mention it. Not, it's not for me. 
What I did testify about was the scientific papers that we've written. So we introduced four scientific papers in this hearing. And it was a complete surprise to this delegation of ABFL people because that hadn't happened before. Nobody had actually tried to introduce science in a bite mark hearing. But the problem with the case was that the a plea bargain was, was obtained and the judge was never ruled on admissibility. So, you know, too bad. We thought we had a good, good chance there. So after that, the American Board of Forensic Ontology invited Mary and I to give a closed door presentation of our work. Basically, they wanted to know why we'd done what we had, why we're testifying in court with this stuff, you know, and so we couldn't refuse. We did this closed door presentation. Um, and immediately afterwards, that same gentleman who wrote that NAS report stuff came up to me and demanded it that we retract the papers. And of course, there's no way we're going to do that. Uh, we believe in what we did. So then um, we have a second hearing, New York City, Clarence Dean, uh, capital murder case. Um, and this time it's a Fry hearing. It's the first time that we were going to have a Fry hearing. Um, and the, the idea that it had, uh, the evidence should, should meet um, peer, uh, what is it? General acceptance. General acceptance, that's right, yeah. Um, and guess who the prosecution witness was here? It's the same guy that wrote the NS report, All right? Um, but this time, um, here's the bite mark again, a ridiculous looking thing. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that. Once again, the ABFO sent a delegation to the, to the hearing. Um, Mary is the witness for the, for the defense. She was two days on the stand. And, of course, by now they're prepared. They saw the hearing in Alabama. They realized that we we're going to introduce these scientific papers. And they produced a package of criticisms of, of our work, in detailed criticism. They tried to find every, anything wrong they could possibly find. And um, one of the things they did um, was to write letters to the editor of the Journal of Forensic Sciences. Now, with scientific journals, you often get letters to the editors written. It usually comes out immediately after a paper is published, usually in the next issue. And the purpose of the letter to the editor is to dispute a scientific fact or finding all right, by, by showing it some other evidence about it. So in this case, the ABFO wrote two letters, and the um, they were up to four to five years after we published our papers, so this was completely the wrong thing to do. Instead of disputing the scientific facts, they actually personally criticized us. They criticized us for testifying in a courtroom. And so this is absolutely ridiculous. It was reject rejected by the editor of the Journal of Forensic Sciences very rightly. Um, nonetheless, the letters to the editor were used in the brief in the Dean case. Now, this... Um, is ethically um, a wrong thing to do because it's specifically f forbidden to use letters to the editor in court cases to bolster your, your side. So this is an unethical tactic by the prosecuting attorney in the Clarence Dean case. So what happened, um, there was only a verbal ruling in the, f in the Fry hearing. Um, in this case, bite, bite marks could be admitted, but the prosecution in the end decided not to use bite mark evidence, and there's probably a a few reasons for that. So then there was a third hearing. Again, Mary was the ex expert for the defense. Um, this was a post-conviction bench hearing. Um, Douglas Prade was um, convicted of murder of his wife based on this bite mark, which is through two layers of clothing. And once again, I, uh, I express incredulity at, the, at, at what we're seeing here. This is just amazing. Um, Prosecution used another tactic. They actually, this is the prosecuting attorney for the Prade case, but in the Dean case, they actually got this guy to go to the Dean case to watch Mary testify because they knew that we would be testifying in both cases. So here's an interesting tactic. They get the other attorney to come and you know, examine while Mary's doing her, her, the defense. Very sadly, um, well, the judge in the lower court set Parade free. Um, the decision was overruled in a higher court. He's back in jail. Um, so he had a brief uh, period of freedom, which is just an awful thing to contemplate that he's back in jail again. So then, shortly after that, the American Board of Forensic Odontology has their annual meeting. And, and during that annual meeting, they have a dinner, and they have a dinner speaker. 
and they invited, in 2012, they invited the district attorney from the New York C City Dean case to speak. And she gave a 45 minute criticism of Mary as a witness. It, uh, it was unprofessional, inappropriate, disturbing and unethical and of course Mary wasn't there so there's no opportunity for rebuttal. Remarkably, that some of the ABFO members were very upset about this, so give them some credit that they actually made complaints um, that it was unprofessional. Um, and so we, we heard about this. We actually demanded uh, an apology from the ABFO leadership. And we were told that Mary deserved the treatment she received because she had an opinion. And the opinion was that bite marks should not be admitted. And this is from the leadership of this organization that supposedly is no practitioners, let's just put it that way. So because the case was still open when she did this, this amounted to witness intimidation because Mary is potentially a witness in the main part of the trial of Clarence Dean, not just for the hearing. So this is completely unethical behavior by a district attorney and it takes it, I mean, I understand we learned now enough about the adversarial nature of what happens in the courtroom, but this is taking that adversarial behavior outside of the courtroom. And so we were really uh, surprised and unhappy about this. However, all of this stuff, all of this involvement um, has led to us being in the most incredible selection of media. We never expected this aspect of it. Um, Washington Post ran a series of five great articles written by Radley Balco. Um, we were on the second page, our pictures on the second page of the Wall Street Journal. N nature, to get into nature, and that's the second biggest journal in the, in the world. And my nephew in England was watching the BBC News on a Saturday and saw pictures of us on the video. So all of this stuff has happened. Um, it, it's, it's been a roller coaster. I mean, negative plus positive things that have happened for us. So as a result of that media, um, Mary was invited to, a, to speak at a congressional hearing on Capitol Hill. And the invitation was to testify about the bullying tactics used by the practitioners. <coughs> and that was an experience, as you might imagine, to uh, be present in that, uh, that panel hearing. Um, that's available online. Then, of course, um, I, was t I testified at the Texas Forensic Science Commission, and John meant also mentioned this. Um, the decision that came out of that uh, science commission was the recommendation of a, of a moratorium. Now, that's a recommendation, it's not a, it's not a ruling, they're not eliminating bite marks, but it's a step at least in the right direction. And uh, John also mentioned PCAST. Well, um, President's Council on Advisors of Science and Technology, I don't think that exists anymore in this administration. Um, but I testified before these people, it was a very interesting experience. Um, Absolutely the top scientists in the nation on this, very, very intelligent people, run by a brilliant person, the, ch the chair of the, of the uh, council. Um, and the interesting thing was, I was asked to talk about bite marks, and this, the meeting, the hearing at which I was asked to talk was run under Chatham House Rules. Now, Chatham House Rules are designed to protect whistleblowers. And so I was protected under the rules of the, of the, of the hearing that my, my identity was protected. So obviously they, they were aware of the controversy that surrounded this stuff. Well, the report came out in um, 2016, and it was damning. And I think John quoted this a little bit. PCAST finds that bite mark analysis does not meet the scientific standards for foundation validity and is far from meeting such standards. And that's a pretty damning finding, right? And then at the bottom here, However, PCAST considers the prospect of developing bite market analysis into a scientifically valid method to be low. We advise against devoting significant resources to such evidence. So there's not going to be another three quarters of a million dollar grant put out for a bite mark analysis. Well, the interesting thing after that was the National District Attorneys Association responded to the PCAST report. This is a letter to the President of the United States, President Obama, November 2016. And basically, the NDAA disagreed with just about everything in the PCAST report. Um, then they dealt, the, the report dealt with other forensic sciences other than bite mark analysis. But specifically in this letter, the response to the PCAST report, they say, 
<laughs> the studies by Mary and Peter Bush were poorly designed and executed and as a result did not reliably demonstrate anything. How about that? So this is the National District Attorneys Association. And again, I understand that the that adversarial uh, procedures are necessary in the courtroom, but this again is taking the adversarial nature of it outside of the courtroom. This is a letter to the President of the United States. And it's, it's, it, they also say that our studies have been thoroughly discredited in court. That was the Clarence Dean case. The, the judge never made a written ruling, so that's, that's nonsense too. So this is, this is the response that we get. This is a national response. And the only thing that kind of makes it better for me is that shortly after this came out, this paper was published. So this forensic bite mark identification, weak foundations, exaggerated claims, Journal of Law and Biosciences, 38 authors, and we are two of them. The other 36 people on this author list are some of the best respected uh, legal uh, scholars, professionals, statisticians, scientists in the nation. We are absolutely proud to be rubbing shoulders with this group. And in fact, the Lead author, Michael Sachs, um, wrote an article that was published in the journal Science in 2005. And in that journal article in Science, Michael Sachs predicted that there would be a paradigm shift in forensic science. And this paper here, I believe, really is the paradigm shift. It's uh, what's going to go next. Uh, how can the science become accepted in court? I think it's a lot has to do with the judge's willingness to break precedent. Uh, Bite mark evidence has yet to be rejected, but the hope is that we might see that happen next month, hopefully, right? So has there really truly been a paradigm shift? I believe there is. I think we're right in the middle of it, and it's an interesting and exciting time to be part of this. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, you know, I... I I think that the, the one sort of takeaway that I have after hearing all of this is when we talk about criminal justice, sometimes we say, you know, justice for whom, right? And I think the answer inevitably is justice for the victims. <clears throat> and I guess the question is in these cases, I think we've shown that there are a lot of victims. Um, Keith Harward, obviously, and I know everybody says they're sorry, but let me add my name to the list. Um, you're a victim. Uh, Peter and Mary, when I hear the the pushback and the blowback that you've gotten um, and some of these tactics, I think that, that you are victims. I also want to point out that in every single one of these cases where there's been a wrongful conviction, the victims are the people who were the victims of the crimes themselves and their families who waited years, if ever, for the actual perpetrator to be identified. And so we have a really a systemic problem that we've got to address here. And, uh, and we need to do so quickly. And I'm, Chris, I'm looking forward to your Daubert hearing uh, in March, and we, uh, me too. We, we hope for the best. So uh, could you join me one more time in thanking our panelists? And we will take questions. Uh, if anybody would like to ask questions for anybody, we need to get you a microphone, sir. Thanks, Adam. My question is for Mr. Harward. Mr. Harward, if I miss this, I'm sorry, but were you in the Navy or the Marine Corps? I was in the Navy. Well, actually, the crime was when the crime was committed, I was in the Navy, but I'd been discharged a couple, three weeks when I was arrested, so I was already out of the Navy. Well, well then that might moot my question. But so uh, you'd already been discharged? Yes, sir. So you, you, you received a, an honorable discharge? Uh, yes, sir. Oh, okay. Because I was going to tell you to apply to have your discharge upgraded. I understand, yes. Other questions? Sir? I managed to escape childhood without being bitten by a human, or a dog for that matter, but um, how prevalent are bite marks? How prevalent is the human behavior oh, of bite marks? I think is the question. I guess I'm the authority on this. <laughs> <laughs> As I'm constantly searching for them. Um, you know, nobody knows because nobody know what the like what the hell a bite mark actually looks like unless you were actually there. You know, I mean, it's uh, so 
you know, the, I can tell you that bite mark cases are not very common. Um, as a father of two young kids, bite marks are common. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> it's like, I was one uh, of six children. <laughs> uh, well, in, in, in around the fabricants were, you know, <laughs> were robust. Oh, the, oh, the irony. I'm just going to make a quick commentary, uh, John, and I'll pass off the microphone. We, we, you know, we're in a very corrupt city, and I'm thankful, and I was talking to Dan Stevenson about this earlier, that we actually have a district attorney now, and I'm a Republican, and I'm glad this guy's a district attorney. His name's Larry Krasner, and he's a Democrat. He's a very liberal Democrat, and he's against the death penalty. And so my comment is, thank God you were not executed and, you know, I, I'm a Catholic, so I look at this from a religious point of view, but I'm also a law clerk, and I've had personal experiences with corrupt judges, and judges can make anything happen that they want to happen. And that's just a fact. If a judge wants you to be acquitted, guarantee you, you will be acquitted. If a judge wants you to be convicted and wants to put his thumb on a scale, you're going to be convicted. And I'm against the death penalty because judges can rig cases. That's a fact. And if you're dead, you're dead. And I don't know how, and I always explain this to people that are adamantly death penalty people. I said, well, listen, I'll be for the death penalty. When you can explain to me how, just use today for example, today's Tuesday. If you put a person to death today on Tuesday, you find out the guy on Friday was actually innocent, and you can bring him back to life. I'll be for the death penalty today. But you no, know, I don't know how you bring somebody back to life that's innocent. So I'm totally against the death penalty for that reason. So that's just my commentary. If you want to add to that, you can please add to it. Well, since I lived three decades in prison, if, if you want to exact your punishment out of someone, especially someone that's heinous in their actions, uh, don't put them to death. That's an easy way out. Let them live every day knowing that they're going to be there every day. See, I had to deal with that, but I was not guilty. I was innocent. I was able to get by with the fact that I knew I was innocent and to do anything otherwise would give them more fuel to fuel the fire with, oh, look at him, he's, he's acting up because he's a criminal. I didn't do that. And people said to me before, I don't, I don't think I could have done that. I believe I would have committed suicide. I don't believe I could have done the time. If I would have done that, what would the prosecutor and the judge and the detective say? Ah, see, he knew he was wrong. He couldn't live with himself. He's killed himself. But if you want to punish someone, uh, let him live the rest of their life in prison because there are people that deserve to be in prison. But an easy way out for some people is to execute them. I lived every day. I, it's, it's not an easy way to go. And for someone to have to realize that every day they get up, that they've got to go through that same routine, they've got to watch their back every day, they've got to eat bad food, they've got to realize that loved ones, in some cases, don't care about them anymore. Uh, that's a tough road to hope. And that's, that's my opinion. Uh, and, and to back it up is, is your point, you know, dead is dead. And Chris could probably tell you about people that, that's been executed that were not guilty. Yeah, absolutely. One, one thing I, I just wanted to, to say about Leigh Krasner, I, um, um, I'm sorry that she's not here. Patricia Cummings is the new uh, Conviction and Integrity Unit Director in Leigh Krasner's District Attorney's Office. and. Um, Peter put up a picture of Stephen Mark Cheney's uh, bite mark in Texas. And at that time, uh, Patricia Cummings was the head of the Conviction Integrity Unit in Dallas. And um, we went and gave a presentation to her and to Susan Hawk, who was the district attorney at that time, about Stephen Cheney's case and explained to her Mary and Peter's uh, research, which has been instrumental in virtually every case that we've ever done and everything that we know about bite marks and the rest of the facts of the case, they did an investigation for 
at least nine months, reinvestigated every aspect of the case, and then they joined our motion to uh, dismiss the case and vacate the conviction, and we walked Mr. Cheney out of prison through the cooperation of a robust uh, conviction integrity unit that was devoted to rooting out injustices like Mr. Harwart's and Mr. Cheney. So uh, for those of you who are in a position to support that work here, I encourage you to do so. Are there any studies that uh, that support bite mark bite mark uh, 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 evidence in court? Is there any positive studies that say it's a good idea? Not that we're aware of. Right. Most most of the studies that are a little bit more supportive, um, I, I, again, either have a very small um, study design. Um, there was one that looked at uniqueness as a dentition, and they had. Um, 33 upper jaws and 23 23 yeah. and then it was an odd number so between the upper and the lower and they determined that the human dentition was unique on a very small sample size so again a lot of the ones that are pointing to more positive um, results don't have an adequate sample size um, not, not properly designed so what Mary's talking about is a paper by a New Zealand uh, author and that paper was concerned with the uniqueness of the dentition so measuring dental shape right in doing something like that, you want to have a statistically valid and useful sample size. So when we did it, we had a sample size of 1,100 individuals. When this person did it, he had 23 individuals. So you see there's a huge uh, difference in that. We also didn't report what his measurement error was, so we don't know if small differences were just due to just random error, if there were true differences. Yeah, so really, uh, th there's nothing, and there's nothing... Um, People have used dogs, pigs, uh, wax, styrofoam. Um, we're the only people to have actually used the cadaver model for the skin studies. And, and for skin studies, um, we did something that hadn't been done in the, in the forensic dentistry literature at all, which was is to research skin. I mean, there's a huge literature on skin in plastic surgery, um, other fields of, you know, of, of medicine. And people have used cadavers to, do, to study the biomechanical properties of the skin for hundreds of years. Yeah, so it's a valid model. It's something that's been used, even though we've been criticized pretty heavily on that. But no, the, the, um, so in, in science, when you publish new stuff, you really hope as a scientist that somebody else will come along and repeat your study. It validates your study, and if, you're, if, if their results don't come out the same as yours, well, that's, that's okay too, so something's wrong with one of the studies, right? Um, that hasn't happened. We haven't had people reproduce our studies. I think, I'm not sure if that answers your question. But. There's also another study by Ray Rawson that you guys falsified that, that suggested that the, the chance of, of a random match in a bite marks was one in eight million that was picked up by the Arizona Supreme Court, and I believe it still stands as valid precedent today. That, right. you know. that, that study was done in um, 1984, and it was used for precedent for over 26 years when you know, we sat down with our statistician who just who's lost sleep over reading that paper saying this is just not correct. And we repeated that. So even though there's not really been any other groups repeating our studies, we have repeated some of these other ones. Like we, Peter said, the one with the 23 models, we repeated it with a much larger sample size. And also the one that Chris is talking about, we repeated that study as well and kind of just debunked what they, were, what they had so Rawson's 1994 paper had the title Statistical Evidence for the Uniqueness of the, of the Dentition. So the paper we published that refuted his work had the title Statistical Evidence for the Similarity of the Dentition. Right. A little bit of fun in science there. Passes for fun in science. Um, <laughs> so I had a question about the rape kit that was lying in the box. So had they never, because we've read a lot about how the, the hundreds of thousands of rape kits that are lying in boxes in this country. So had they never tested the rape kit? They were, and preferred to use this bogus science instead of testing the rape kit? They had their man. Once you're convicted, you're convicted. Mm -hmm. They don't put any effort, money, or time into it. Uh, exonerations, uh, Chris can tell you, it's total pushback because, you know, once you're there, they're on to the next case. They don't have time to look over it, except for they do have, like in Texas, the, the uh, you just mentioned it, the uh, 
the integrity the, unit. Yeah. There are some states starting to do that now where they're setting up units that go and review cases and stuff. Uh, I've asked when I was in New Orleans last year uh, down there talking uh, to the odontologist down there and I, I told him I said you know this stuff's all bogus you know the best thing for you to do is to go back and find those cases and go to those lawyers or find someone and say hey you know this is not right I testified this is not right I want to make this right by telling you this not right so let's bring this person out and retry them and use real evidence don't don't use makeup stuff you know and as marissa bluestein who's the head of the pennsylvania innocence project here would tell you is that we in the innocence movement and john would tell you uh lobby very hard for evidence preservation statutes you know so something like this is like some because we know that there are many, many more Keith Harwards in prison and we need to preserve the evidence to make sure it gets tested. And, and the reason I didn't act earlier is I did not know these places existed, these organizations. I had another inmate say, your case is so screwed up. You need to write this guy. He just got through reading Barry Sheck's book, who's one of the co-founders of the Instance Project. So I wrote him a letter. I, you know, I didn't think nothing of it. And you know, eight years later, you know, they say, hey, are you interested in us representing you? <laughs> Duh, you know. <laughs> uh, so we have time for two more questions. Uh, the, Regina? I, I just wanted to know where Pennsylvania stands with regard to Mr. Howard's plea that um, people who are exonerated get compensation. Mercy? Yeah, I, uh, uh, no, zero, not even an I'm sorry. Let Spencer ask a question. This, this Spencer Short is an attorney that's worked on uh, many bite mark cases with me and is a fabulous lawyer and a brilliant scholar. I thought he was a plant. I, I, wanted, I wanted to end on a note of despair. I'm worried about despair. what you might ask. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say, uh, we, we've talked about the, the DNA evidence and everything like that, but what are the avenues when there isn't DNA evidence and do you know that you have bankrupt science? Are there any? This is a, uh, it's not a plan, but it is actually an excellent question. The, uh, um, in the many right now, uh, California and Texas have the only um, shifted science statutes that provide for an avenue of post-conviction relief where science that was used at trial has over the court, because, you know, as John was talking about the shoots and ladders problem, well, when you have a ladder, Scientific knowledge is built upon scientific knowledge, and sometimes it changes. It just doesn't all go in one direction. So what we think may be valid today, you know, we may find out tomorrow, is not. And this isn't because of people, bad people, or anything like that, or even, you know, judges sleep at the gate. You know, I mean, it's just science changes. So those two states have a specific avenue for relief to get back into court if you can demonstrate um, that the science has been discredited or we have a new understanding. Otherwise, you have to argue that the shift in science is newly discovered evidence and, you know, fight like hell, as you and I have done in other places. And um, it's an important thing that legislatures have been taking up um, in various states. And in fact, um, it's being considered right now in Connecticut. And I'll say that on Thursday, um, we're going to walk out Alfred, or not, we walked him out in June, and Alfred Swinton is going to be exonerated in yet another bite mark conviction um, that he spent uh, 22 years in prison for a crime that he did not commit. He was 52 years old and never been committed a crime in his life and was put away almost entirely on bite mark analysis. And um, his family, he was tarred as a serial killer. They tried to put five more bodies on him. His entire family's reputation was destroyed. His daughter was a lawyer, you know, and they've been destitute as a result ever since. And the, um, the dentist who gave that testimony, to his great credit, categorically recanted every word of his testimony, line by line. And also in one of Marissa's cases, um, Crystal Weimer did the same thing. And so that's incredibly unusual and heroic for a scientist to recognize new data and change one's mind. As we know, as we sit here today in our current political situation, how hard it is once you've locked into one position to change your mind. So much credit to Gus Karazoulis. All right, well, again, I want to thank you all for uh, your attention and your great questions, and thank our panelists. Prosecutor, you got to ask the prosecutor. Oh, I'm sorry, Dave, did you have a question? Oh, God, let's hear it.
We, we got time for one more. We got, I mean, and, and, and let me, I want to introduce Dave LeBon, who's the Executive Director of the Association for Prosecuting Attorneys. We've co-sponsored events with Dave, and uh, I really appreciate your being here, Dave. I think it's, uh, it's important that, uh, that you came, and we want to thank you for that. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation, and, and I, as I said here in, in, in Chris's comments, uh, the one thing I did want to say was the question on the rape kit. Having been a prosecutor, sex crimes prosecutor from the 80s, that one would actually be a kit that was considered tested because they did do the serology on it. What's great is that the, that the kit was still there. Um, back in the 80s when I was doing the work, we had the side-by-side, -side, we had the serology as well as the DNA. And I don't, I, you, you're right, uh, Keith, on the uh, concept of the perfect storm. I don't understand why any, because what does serology show you? It shows you the blood type. Um, you know, I, I, I don't know why, how somebody could miss that. Um, or truly is uh, absolutely fabricated evidence. But I love the last question, because I think that's the hard place where we're at. And I also appreciate the comment about Susan Hawk when, when she was the DA uh, in Dallas, and Dallas's work really beginning one of the, one of the true and, and valiant uh, conviction integrity units. But it's a real challenge for the prosecutor's office. DNA is easy. You know, when you get the, the, the fact that this is the real perpetrator, it's very easy for the prosecutor uh, to stand up and say, I know, and, and you talk about the victims. John, your point is so well taken. Everybody's a victimized. And, and Mr. Harwood, in, likely in your case, the kidnapping uh, crime of which the true killer was convicted of, that's likely to have happened after uh, Mr. Harwood was wrongfully convicted. So you had a victim, you have another set of victims that, that if, if the system had worked, uh, they wouldn't have been victimized. Well. That's one of the three points of what I talk about, collateral damage. Uh, put aside what happened to me as a victim. Uh, the three points I consider is the fact that the state, that the taxpayers of Virginia, in my case, were sold a bill of goods. Uh, the, the, the trials, uh, all the paperwork, the people involved, the transportation, my time in prison, cost millions and millions of dollars, easily. The second part is, that in, in wrongful conviction cases, probably 999 out of 1,000 or maybe 1,000, the person that actually commits a crime continues to c commit crime. And in my case, you know, somebody says, oh, you got away with murder. He actually did. Uh, he went on to commit crimes. And here's the most, the, the thing I think of the most are the victims, the, the woman that was raped and the family of the man that was killed. Uh, they thought closure had occurred because the monster had been put away. Well, to find out 30-some years later that was not the case, that, that had to be a shock. The poor woman was raped, okay? A woman can never get over a rape, but she could probably deal with it from day to day. I wouldn't know. I, I, I wouldn't even try to attempt that. But the fact of the matter is that after I was convicted for this crime for which I did not do, if she heard a noise outside, she could think, oh, it's not that monster, it's a limb against the house because that monster's put away. Well, to find out 30-some years later that no, the monster was still out there and that he was doing bad things, and the fact that now, these 30-some years later, she has to relive all this again because I'm in the media because those criminals in Newport News that broke laws to have me convicted, now she has to realize, oh, all this, and it was media at the time, and, and, and she's living in the town still that, where this happened. Uh, she has to realize, wow, this is all happening to me again. I'm having to re re relive it through the fact that I was exonerated, and it's all over in the newspaper, the papers, and that kind of thing. So that's another reason that, that, that you know, I was a victim, but... There's all this other collateral damage that comes from wrongful convictions. And if they had waited until, because Jerry Crotty, who's the guy that actually did it, he was AWOL at the time. Well, why was he AWOL, you think? That's not far to, to, to try to figure out. But when I showed up, my face got there, all the rest of that went to a side. And, you know, prosecutors and district attorneys, once they latch on to somebody, and there's many, many cases in the state of Virginia to where they got the guy. We thought we had the guy, but it turned out it wasn't him. 
They were just wanting to get a conviction because a prosecutor, to be a prosecutor, has to prosecute. Plus the fact there's a lot of pressure in a lot of cases. And that's why I think it's important to get it right. But I think the discussion and working, John, with you in the Quattrone Center, how can we do this? What is our pathway forward? But it is the more difficult cases now where you don't have that clear, here's the evidence that exonerates the individual. Is it the right individual? Isn't it the right individual? And especially someone who served a significant amount of time. I think those are the really uh, tough cases because what evidence are you going to look at? I, I agree, and I just I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that um, Alfred Swinton is going to be exonerated on the consent of Gail Hardy, who is the uh, state's attorney in Hartford, Connecticut, over a significant pressure from the police department and um, in the face of that because he was excluded from the DNA that they found at the crime scene and because she accepted the recantation that the bite mark evidence was not valid. And she must be applauded for having the courage to do it because it wasn't an easy case, but he was clearly innocent and he was, you know, uh, and, and he would have died in prison for sure. So lots of problems, but signs of progress. Thanks, guys.